There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. A dimension of sound. For the 158th time, you are not getting out of here. Please let me finish the Count of Monte Cristo. A dimension of sight. No change at all. What? I, I think I look fine. A dimension of mind. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Fifth Dimension of Twilight Zone podcast. Merry Christmas to you all and to all. Good night. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. Um, <laughs> that was so we're back. Podcast we've done. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Right. Three seconds long is great. <laughs> Woo! Um, <laughs> but we're back, of course. We're back to talk a new episode. I'm once again joined by Triv and, of course, uh, Jacob Anders reviews. Jacob as well. Uh, what you guys? How you guys doing? How has your week in the Twilight Zone been? You guys been? Uh, Sally going insane, uh, needing stuff, you know, what you need, all that good stuff. I mean, I ate a lot of corn. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> she started it. Yes. <laughs> I had corn tonight, actually. <laughs> I was on a corn cob, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't mean, wait till we get we... to the actual, like, corn. Uh, is the is the, the kid that wishes to get everybody into the cornfield? That was from the 60s series, right? Bill Mimi? Um I don't know the question that answer. Anyway, I'll, I'll, yeah, I think it, I think it is because I remember it being in black and white. So I, I think I think That's it right, was. Everybody, you're here for the expert's opinion on the Twilight Zone. <laughs> I know. Hey, we're going. We're going as we go. Yeah, there you're you still go. learning. We're going to learn more about corn than you are about the Twilight Zone by this point. So <laughs> exactly. Already we are. We are. Man. We are journeying into a plane of existence that is beyond that of normal man. The corn cobs. <laughs> this is corn cob zone. Also, the Twilight um, Zone, but you know. Exactly. Exactly. I just love that the people that didn't watch last week's episode have no fucking idea what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, there should be a, a thing up in the corner that tells you to go back to last week's episode. So, uh, oh, I, I think the editor can figure that one out pretty easily. So, yay. <laughs> um so anyways we are a twilight zone podcast not a twilight podcast a twilight zone podcast that talks about the famous rod sterling series uh as always you can find us on youtube on my page till i can figure out and get off my lazy ass and uh, create an actual page for this channel as well as we have an audio feed you know through itunes and soundcloud and uh but anyways you can uh you can find us on audio for, for audio forms as audio well. format Thank you. Audio uh, feeds, no as they call it. Rate, subscribe, all that nonsensical BS. Um, so anyways, Jacob, I have to ask, how do you feel after last week's episode recording? How do you feel, you know, coming on to a second episode in a row, having to deal with our nonsense? Kind of corny. No, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel good. I feel pretty good. After, um, I still got to get I started trying to get caught up on the uh, 10 episodes or nine episodes leading up to my arrival. And uh, so I haven't caught up quite all the way, but I'm getting there. I hope by next week I'll have those other nine watched. But yeah, I love this show. So I'm always looking, I think is I'm happy to have an excuse to watch it all again and, <laughs> and sit here and dissect it. And and I'm looking forward to coming, coming upon some episodes and, and maybe having my opinion changed on them because maybe I think oh, I was all right. And then maybe by the time they get to the end of the episode, I'm like, yeah, it was, that was awesome. Or I don't know. But... <laughs> <laughs> so thoughts on the 16 millimeter shrine then. <laughs> I haven't finished that one yet, but uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about my thoughts on that next week. Yeah. There you go. Um, so Triv, I know your thoughts uh, of life in general, at least I think I do. You actually have no headphone, extra headphones now. What is going on here? Uh, the the or the uh, snowman back here uh, decided to steal them, so I made the snowman sit in place of them. Now, is he going to be? Is he going to be like a killer snowman? Or are we going to find you? Your like avatar head chopped off at some point. You're just talking through your head, your avatar head. I mean, how's this going to work? Well, you might, you know, week to week. <laughs> you never know. I might turn into a snowman. Uh, there are many uh, horror movies that involve snowmen, so my fate could be sealed by a lot of things. Jack Frost. Yes, exactly. The Jack one with Frost Michael Keaton. Two. That's the scariest. No, it is. Know, really. right? <laughs> Although the uh, the Jack Frost two, the one with the like Jack Frost has like a kid. That one's actually pretty scary too. Is that no? The first one's the one where it starts with like the truck that crashes and. Yep. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that movie. It, wow. <laughs> isn't there actually a sequel to the Michael Keaton one? Uh, I don't know actually. 
There's too many Jack Frosts. It's, it's Christmas. <laughs> they there's came out a year this. apart. I think there's one with Zac Efron. Hmm? Wouldn't Zac Efron Jack Frost at some point? I don't know. Possibly. Am I? Is that more like a wish fulfillment thing? I'm just thinking about. I don't know. I mean, he does have a sexy chest. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> no. Decent singing voice. Yeah. I mean, I think I could see you guys hooking up. He, he'll get some people frosty. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'll do the opposite of frosty. He might get them hard, but frosty has nothing to do with it. He mm. could. He's gonna. He's traveling gonna in the wrong circles. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna put you on ice. Wow, this is already tangenting to hell. <laughs> Direct no, you I, I should probably, <laughs> I should probably continue. Um, so, anyways, we're not talking about snowmen today. That is in a different episode down the future. I'm sure there's some snowmen in some episodes somewhere. Uh, today, we're talking about season one, episode twelve, which is called "What You Need." What you need is an episode that um, is going to be very interesting to talk about because I'm pretty sure none of us remember this episode, or at least I didn't remember this episode at all. I didn't um, either. Nope. I, I, yeah, I was say I'm sure, I was pretty sure Jacob doesn't remember. Uh, but it's directed by uh, Alvin Ga- Ganser, Alvin Gonzer. I don't know, however you say his last name. Written by Rod Sterling, based off the uh, story What You Need by Lewis Paget. And uh, production code is 173-3622, uh, which means it was the 22nd pro- uh, episode in production. And actually, ironically, aired on Christmas Day, which is um, doesn't happen very often anymore when it comes to TV series. But for a Christmas time episode, this is a very, uh, it's something. I'm telling you that. I'll tell you what it's right not now. very Christmassy. Yeah, I well, know. that's the reason I got the snowman. I was trying to, you know, Christmas things up a little bit. I know it's probably the probably the most jolly thing we're going to talk about is your snowman there. So, hey, I I um, think the way that this episode ended is pretty awesome, and I wouldn't have minded seeing more Twilight Zone episodes like this. Well, I mean, we had escape clause, so I mean, you might True. just get your wish again. So, but starting out, not as you as we said, we don't really remember this at all. Did you have any inkling what you were getting yourself into when you were watching this? Either one you can go first, but did you guys have any inkling what this story was even about? Or did you have, like, knowing where it was going to end, did you go, oh, my God? I mean, did you know anything at all about this episode or anything that you want to talk about starting out? I mean, I, I thought it was going to be maybe possibly a uh, a documentary about the Master P classic. I got the hookup. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it was not. I guess the date. <laughs> The 25th or December 25th, 1959, which would be 20 years almost to the day before I was born. Should have probably given it away, but no, I didn't know uh, what was, what it was going to be about. Uh, I, I don't, I, I was sitting there watching it and I was like, man, I know I've seen them all. So I had to have seen it, but mm-hmm. I just do not remember this at all. So, and even going into it, I was trying to figure it out. I mean, you figure out at least what its hook is fairly early on, but yeah. No, 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 no idea whatsoever besides the fact that it looks like it takes place in the same bar as last week's episode. I know, That's right? What, I, I, I have that. that in my notes. <laughs> I was Tardis, like, dude, Tardis I love all. <laughs> exactly. This is like my favorite uh, phone booth of any show called Twilight Zone ever made. That and Maybe can this... I also say that apparently in this bar, in the in the time between weeks, beer went up to 80 cents instead of <laughs> 40 cents last week. <laughs> And it lost pretty much all its females, too. Like, there's only one chick in this bar. Last week, there was at least a few more. And um, this is a... uh, This is is probably where they were supposed to go last week, was this, you know, this time frame. So, because they they definitely needed to survive and become not real anymore, or real. So, maybe this is where they were supposed to go. (laughs) To to figure out what they need. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Um, How about you, Trip? Did you have any inkling in what you're getting yourself into at all? You know, once you knew what the hook was, like Jacob, you kind of had a general idea how it was going to mm-hmm. end up. But you, when you said um, before we, but earlier today, when you were saying how dark it was, I, I thought it was going to go a different direction than what it went. Yeah. So my thought no, was the person that got taken out was different than I thought it was going to be. Mm. And just, just knowing um, escape clause, I thought it was going to, yeah, anyway. I kind of guessed you know his reasoning for doing what he does in the end i kind of guess that because of the really weird way he was acting Mm -hmm. i was like i think maybe he's seeing something along those lines which we'll get to i didn't know that he was gonna take that dark turn and i kind of like that i kind of like the way i like that aspect of it it's um it definitely as you as you watch the episode and what he does it definitely instills a particular type of trope where it becomes very apparent of what he is and how he is and 
Yeah, we'll get into that. But um, a dick. <laughs> well, that too. Yeah. Well, yeah, hell, the opening dick. narration gives you that. I mean, that this yeah, is one of my home. favorite opening narrations. <laughs> like this feels like something. And I guess without getting too much into it, this feels like this is someone that Rod Serling knew in life. I'm gonna, <laughs> I am just gonna give it to this guy for being a dick. And this, yeah, this guy was a bully to him in high school or something. Oh, like totally. <laughs> More than half of the words in that opening opening narration are like descriptive terms for being a douche. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. My just the use of well, I guess I should probably wait until after we do the opening narration. But there's one line in here. I chuckled at so hard because it's true then, and it's even more true now. The fact that they made a I guess a quote unquote joke about it just tickled my fancy something fierce. <laughs> Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, just real quick, the music's by Nathan Van Cleve, who actually did the music for White Christmas. Oh, that was nice. kind of interesting. Yeah. So the episode. So we'll get into the episode. The episode starts with a literal man walking into a bar, like a joke. The man walks into a bar. Bartender tells the guy, "We sell booze, not space." And um, I thought that was kind of funny because he writes, uh, "Man threatens man." <laughs> the man who we end up finding is uh, Fred Renard. Is man threatens with, "How would you like to fly? Uh, take a flying jump uh, at the moon? At the moon, which is yeah, I wrote that yeah, down too. Which is, <laughs> which is perfect. How would you like I to jump these... at the moon? <laughs> <laughs> what? By, by, <laughs> well, well, I said by the time great, we're done, like, really talk to me like that again. Gen- you're gonna get sucked in the puss. <laughs> <laughs> What's great about it is it's one of those like insults that on its surface sounds really severe, but mm. underneath makes absolutely no sense. Can I say well, that by the time we're in, we're done with all these episodes and done with this podcast or whatever, wherever we go from there, I feel as if my vernacular is going to be like, totally oh, okay. different. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to be talking like a, a 1920s to 40s like monster. <laughs> you will be, um, oh, what the hell is his name? Edward G. Robinson. Exactly. Come here, see? Yeah. Hey, thank I'm you. Gonna Mama, you pussy. I'm on top of the world. <laughs> I'm stuck in a pussy. Hey, I want to take hey. a jump at the moon. You cap up. <laughs> uh, but um, so after the after all that exchange happens, that's when the opening narration happens, and I'll let you I'll let you read it out there. Uh, all right. Woo-hoo. You're looking at Mr. Fred Renard, who carries on his shoulder a chip the size of the national debt. This is a sour man, a friendless man, a lonely man, a grasping, compulsive, nervous man. This is a man who has lived 36 undistinguished, meaningless, pointless, failure-laden years, and who at this moment looks for an escape, any escape, any way, anything, anybody, to get out of the rut. And this little old man is just what Mr. Renard is waiting for. Man, so this guy is the literal (laughs) definition of a sourpuss. Yeah, exactly. He yeah, deserves he, to be socked in the puss. He did uh, Rod Sterling wrong somehow. Oh, <laughs> totally. Whoever this is based on, because there's some true vitriol that he he hates this. Friend. Yes, he does. I was going to say the line about uh, the a chip on his shoulder the size of the That's, national debt. I yeah. just love that line so much. It's awesome. I mean, he says this first whole sentence about sour, friendless, lonely, grasping, and then you... And you period you're like okay and he's like i got more (laughs) (laughs) undistinguished (laughs) meaningless pointless failure laden you sack of piece of shit bag of dicks (laughs) yeah do you think uh you you think steve cochran went in he's reading the scripts he's like what did i do to you oh my god man what did i do to you yeah do we need to dial it back a little bit no (laughs) every bit of it is warranted he pulled out a thesaurus and started going through, what can I use next? <laughs> this episode starts, I meant to say before, but episode starts Steve Cochran, it's Fred Renard, and Ernest Truex, or True, however you say his name, is Pradot. Arlene Sachs is girl in the bar, and Boyd Red Morgan is lefty. So, yeah, the, the, that as, as you can tell from our reaction to the opening narration, it's a one hell of a way to start an episode. <laughs> I'm going to say that it right is. now. It's it is it's, a fiery uh, it, start when normally yeah. you know Sterling is so you know chill and very you know even keeled and this it just not in his not in his tone but in his words is just like <laughs> yeah it's like it's happy it's christmas <laughs> exactly well he's like you know, to the people out there <laughs> no let me describe like, you happy- if i can the krampus <laughs> 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 i do want to say on that there there was 
uh, I think it was the Renard guy, Fred. That's I got my notes also yeah. Fred, but uh, he makes he does make a uh, another um, insult to someone, or he says, "I've been getting the dirty end of the stick since I was four years old." For some reason, that just sounds even <laughs> nastier than the dirty alternative. You know, the shit end of the yeah. stick. I've been getting the dirty end of the stick. That really stuck with me in a not good way. <laughs> Not in a good way. I was just like, I don't like that. <laughs> hey, uh, Nick, we need to make merchandise for for the series and just take like the really weird, um, like sayings from the Twilight Zone. Just like I'm gonna smack you in the put. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Have them like uh, form like uh, Rod Serling's face. Yeah. The, the people at uh, the people at Teespring are gonna be like, "Are you uh, are you doing a sex channel? What are you doing over there?" <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, yes to all that. Of course, it's a sex channel to repressed. <laughs> oh man. So, anyways, um, we we open up in the bar, the bar from last week's episode, which was the uh, in the, when the sky opened up or whatever it's called. And uh, we're introduced to Fred Nard. He's talking to the the bartender, as I said, and they actually don't say his name. the The peddler guy. They don't say his name until like like almost the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. But his name is mm-hmm. Perdot. And or Perdo or however you say his name, and he walks in. They say it two different has, ways. I'll do that in the episode. Yeah, yeah. he says his name is Perdo, and oh, Fred God. says his name is Perdo. Well, okay. leave it to Fred to be a bastard and mispronounce his name. Because yeah, I, I saw know, right? it written online, I looked up the name, and I noticed that when he said it, I was like, "Oh, it's Perdo." And then right after that, he's like, "Listen here, Perdo, <laughs> got the dirty end of the stick, uh, and I'll put it in your puss." <laughs> <laughs> Um, but anyways, he, uh, he walks in and the first person he approaches, or he's actually talking to a bunch of people, but the first person he approaches is a, a woman just at the bar drinking she looks down on her luck. She, he goes up to her and he's like, what do you need? And she, you know, uh, anybody you can imagine would go, oh, cause this guy is asking what I need. <laughs> and so, um, she's like, okay, I guess I need a box of matches. And He's like, but the man knows what she needs, and I'm sure she needs a, a you know, something with a <laughs> plus, need, you know, <laughs> no. something with a plus. I mean, um, uh, when she got man, the we're... cleaning, when she got the cleaning stuff, I was like, okay, Watch this is ass. really stereotypical. It's either really stereotypical or really sexual, depending upon how you take it. Oh, I didn't. Think <laughs> I just figured it takes out I any just... stains. <laughs> I said I just figured he he needed like a, a maid or something like that. I was like, man, this is uh very fifties, and it's uh what he's trying to say. Yeah. But so he Get hands her the clean something, fluid. woman. Yes, <laughs> assholes. But, <laughs> but he hands the clean fluid to her. And she looks at it funny, and he just kind of he walks off. And you know that's when uh, we uh, meet Lefty, who is a guy, of course, who used to play for the Cubs, got hurt, all that good stuff. He's apparently paying too much for beer now because forty cents is just way too uh, way not enough money to survive. <laughs> So it's now 80 cents or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inflation. Well, to see how fancy the bartender was, how could they not charge 80 cents per beer? Maybe know, he, that guy was... he pours beer without a head on it. I know. That guy, that guy, that guy uh, cracks his wise with people. It's pretty funny. Yeah. To rewind real quick also. We yeah. glazed over it. Maybe it's just me and I fixate on these little things. What is cleaning fluid? I mean, it, I it's like, like... A, it's like a, just like a, like spick and span or they like a kind of a clean all. I mean, I know that fluid, liquid, you know, whatever. I don't know. We, I got like cleaner, 409 cleaner, whatever. Yeah, but it's like, here, take this little bottle of cleaning fluid. And I was like, dude, that ain't going to clean shit in my house. I, I got a bunch of kids, I know. But what the, what's that going to like do that well, corner over there? I, I will I will relay this just because whatever. So there was a couple episodes back um, that one of the sponsors for the episode was an instant coffee company. And they made them change um, the fact that they were saying, let us give you tea because it was on a British vessel that was coming across the ocean. They made them change it from tea to coffee because, you know, how dare you mention tea when, you know, we as your sponsor are a coffee dealer. This so I'm back. sure, right. Like, so this is back during the coffee tea wars of 1960. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but one of their big sponsors was uh, Kimberly Clark, which, you know, kind of does all kinds of stuff. So I'm sure had they mentioned, you know, uh, whatever, you know, borax or whatever kind of cleaning solution they were using, they probably had to keep it as generic as possible to not piss off the, the, the you know. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Because back then, like, shows were not just the network themselves, but shows themselves were sponsored by these 
Oh yeah. These companies and stuff. I mean, there nowadays, was this... it's, nowadays it's the, the, it'd be CBS themselves. The yeah. show is whatever, but. Exactly. I well, I mean, I uh, Fred Flintstone used to smoke, I think it was Winston cigarettes back in the day. Fred Flintstone smoked. Yeah. There's a couple, like their very first episodes, like they had advertising for Fred Flintstone smoking. I mean, it That's, doesn't surprise uh... me. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. Now, how did they work in the whole, you know, because everything on the Flintstones had rock in it or something? Uh, how just did they straight work up cigarettes. They, there so was just like, a box. Like, rock cigarette? That could <laughs> no. Take on, like all new meaning <laughs> years later. <laughs> That's why Frank Flintstones was always worth really, <laughs> Yeah, but have a new. Exactly. <laughs> God, what a tangent. Well, yeah, right. Um, she's giving the cleaning fluid. We're over, we're, we're over to the bar where Lefty is explaining about his uh, used to play for the Cubs. Lefty, the guy comes up, the old man, Perdot, Perdo, whatever you want to call him, comes up to the bar and basically asks Lefty what he needs. Uh, Lefty goes, uh, you know, probably a, you know, a good arm or something like that for his left arm uh, with a bartender who cracks wise on everybody, which is pretty funny. He's like, man, I lost money on him. He, like, goes off on him about how he lost money and shit and stuff like that and... It's pretty funny, but yeah, that bartender yeah, so... was like really coming down hard on him. Like that guy was know, like, right? really down. I was like, he just kept on. I was like, damn, <laughs> back up, man. He just exactly. kept on. It, it, like it wouldn't. It was kind of like Ross Sterling in the beginning of this episode. He would not stop. This Everybody goes is hard in about this talking. One. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, but he's like, all oh, the Perdo says, I know what you need. And he has him a bus ticket to Scranton, PA. I'm like, oh, they're going to the uh, Scranton Paper Company. They're gonna I, find, uh, gonna <laughs> I, I know. That's exactly what I thought. I'm like, oh, man, they're going to go to uh, see uh, Michael Scott and they're going to, you know, find the Scranton killer, strangler, or whatever. And, you know, it's going to be you good go. times. <laughs> um, but instead, left to get to call from the same booth that the other guy disappeared from last week. And, um, we find out it's the man, it's his old manager who now is the general manager of the Scranton minor league team, and he's being offered a position as the uh, manager for the team. So that's interesting. So this guy apparently can predict things, and he eventually apparently sees in the future. But before we get into Fred's uh, eventual introduction into this episode, because he's not really has much to do outside of being uh, barraged by the bartender. Uh, what do you guys think of this? Do you uh, do you see where it's going? Do you kind of see him as like a mystic of some sort? What do you guys? Oh think? yeah, I mean, I I think he'd be hard pressed not to know. I mean, your focus is on him, so I think he'd be hard pressed not to see him as some kind of. Something outside the box. Yeah, I, for, you for sure. So you see that as soon, even before like the, the the patrons in the bar know it. You like see how he's like talking to her. He's like, "What do you need?" And she's like, "I box some matches." And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. He's like, "Put your <laughs> put your extremely crumpled ass bill away." Take exactly. This cleaning liquid. <laughs> and you're like, okay. He like knows what they're gonna need. She's gonna like spill something and needed or something like that right so i got that part i didn't know where the episode was going to go though i just knew that there was this douchebag at the end of the bar that was mean mugging the shit out of everybody the whole time and i was like i, I feel like he's going to come into play somehow i really <laughs> thought it was going to be uh the guy uh the baseball player i thought he'd have something to do with it but mm -hmm. it didn't What's kind of interesting is like all of a sudden he looks down and he's like oh man i gotta make sure i'm clean and he realizes there's a spot on his shirt so not only is he need to clean himself up, but the woman has a cleaning fluid, and I think he found his future wife in the process, which I thought <laughs> yep. was kind of yeah. ironically funny. So, so Perdo um, also is a matchmaker. That guy, by the way, Boyd Morgan in real life, um, mm -hmm. he was like a football player, apparently, oh, yeah? like a real life football player. But uh, his claim to fame in my book, he was actually he was an actor. He ended up being an actor too, but um, he was in Blazing Saddles. So I was like, hey, that right there, you win. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> He That's was like amazing. a nobody in the background, but he was in Blazing Set. Right. That's all that matters. <laughs> uh, you can be a well. cow in the background and that gives you street cred. Speaking of right. cows, speaking of cows, I don't know <laughs> what this means. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning something new each week here. But the other guy who played Fred, uh, Steve Cochran, <laughs> if you look into this guy, he, he did a lot of things, but uh, before being an actor, he was something, it does not elaborate on it. It just said he was this and it goes on. I was like, you can't leave it there. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> he was a cow puncher nice, nice. what's Bunch a cow cows. puncher <laughs> i i always assume that maybe they like like not a rodeo clown but they kind of like like tried to maintain the the bulls and stuff 
like if you're at a rodeo like they kind of keep all the all the when the cows get loose they, they're the ones that kind of wrangle them and stuff yeah yes. cow herder yeah he's a herder yeah. but it just like it it said he was a cow puncher and it went on there was no like it wasn't highlighted in blue so i could <laughs> click on it and i was like how do you throw a cow puncher out there and not does everybody know what this is but me am i the dense one here <laughs> but hey, oh it's I a cowboy to... he's a cowboy a cow puncher is a hired hand that tends cows and performs other duties on horseback i guess i could have googled that that's okay mm. i got you covered I, I just figured he was like mongo and just punches a horse <laughs> I, mongo. like punches a cow <laughs> Yes. Um, or Conan. Okay, so the, the he, he punches cow- camels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, oh, the the cow puncher term came from uh uh the early like roundups and stuff like cattle drives when they weren't eager to enter loading chutes or box cars. So the cowboys poked and punched the cattle with long poles in order to get them into the cars. All right. So he actually was, was punching cows right on. Well, with a stick. <laughs> That's nowhere near uh, as entertaining. I want to see him walk up and. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well that's why you watch Punch that's why post. you watch blazing saddles <laughs> yeah oh, man. where are the white women at <laughs> <laughs> um but perdo perdo was continue perdo um actually walks out of the bar and he's outside and fred feeling like he could take advantage of the situation walks out towards perdo and perdo almost gets like this like um oh shit there's someone behind me i don't want to talk to type of situation like a mugger or something and fred you know basically asks him do you know what i need and perdo won't really kind of respond to it but it's actually kind of clever because you're not really thinking about what he what he knows which we find out at the end but fred becomes more and more agitated and forceful and um he actually grabs him by the jacket you know as you like you pick up a guy you like grab him like this or something like that and he's like, what do you need? And that's when the pair of scissors are presented. And at first I'm like, okay, is, is this is the reason he doesn't want to tell him what he needs is because this guy's going to go and like murder that bellhop because he didn't have his key fast enough or something like that. But um, he hands up a pair of scissors. Fred, th- Fred thinks it's a gag. Prado is persistent. This is what he needs. And he goes back to the hotel room or back to the hotel, gets his key, getting ready to go up the elevator and gets his uh, scarf caught in the elevator. So he's screaming out for help and he somehow forgets that he had the scissors in his pocket, but he begins to choke, which I'm like, man, this guy is really into some S and M here, you know, so on and so <laughs> forth. Um, but he, but before the end of the act, he basically is saved because he has the scissors. And, uh, I, at first I'm like, okay, I, I guess this guy was, a, a, was just afraid of this individual and he just had the pair of scissors. He gave them to him and it saved the guy. But if you think about where the story ends up going and what Perdo knows that we don't know at this point, you kind of see why he didn't want to give him the scissors. So <laughs> I guess the real question with, at, the, at the end of this act and from the point where Fred's introduced to where he talks to Perdo and stuff like that, what did you guys think about that? Did you still were confused about what was going on? Like, did you kind of see where the story was going to go? What was your overall opinion on that like last part of the act and the act itself i thought he saw at first before like closer to the end i started to get it but in this by this point i thought that he saw his he saw um uh, renard's death i Mm -hmm. thought he saw that oh if i give him whatever he wants or something something bad is going to happen because the way he was acting Mm -hmm. and so i thought that's why he didn't want to do anything to do with him because he didn't want to lead to whatever it was was going to happen probably his death or him doing something bad but he gave he gives him the scissors and i just gotta say when that elevator closed on his scarf i felt like yeah i think i could pull that out that elevator didn't look like it was too tight on that scarf <laughs> he's probably excited he's like oh man this is exciting too bad oh, there's God. not that woman with the cleaning fluid <laughs> clean fluid I, 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 yeah i just i feel like the, he could have gotten out of that elevator so maybe those scissors were meant for something else but whatever that's, that's the direction they went well with all this stuff though it's been you know it's used in the moment without thinking about using it you know yeah like that's kind of what all this stuff has been i will say um the like what the shot that where it goes from perdo to fred over his shoulder that is a really cool shot that i have a note of that i couldn't remember if it was this scene or the next scene i know it was when he's like right over his shoulder it's like that og like almost like a forced perspective not really forced yeah. perspective but that kind of same feel mm-hmm. that was a really cool shot and it almost looked like it was on a green screen i know it wasn't or a blue screen but i don't think it was that either but it it, no. it was done in such a way that the background looked fake but like in a i mean 
a cool way. I don't know. This is a really interesting choice they made there. It was, especially when you think about the normal studio setup for a good, you know, 90% of the shots in any of these episodes. Say in the uh, street looks familiar to the uh, one for the angels episode, I think. Yeah, it's totally city or uh, one for the angels, that whole bit. Yeah, there. yeah. That street looks real familiar. I think they use if because when I saw it, I was like, I've seen that street a bunch of times before. I, I'm good. It must be off of, you know, it's 20 years ago. Back, when I watched it. Yeah, I bet they use that street a lot in this show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That oh, like is, I think bar. it's just, yeah, I think mm-hmm. it's just the, the back lot for. MGM? It's MGM, right? Or yeah. was it Universal? Uh, no, they CBS shot the first. Universal. Yeah, they, they first shot was... the first like episode Universal because it was the clock tower. I think you said they went right. to MGM, so if then... I remember it. Right, right, right. That's right. So yeah, it was that probably MGM backlot. It's probably why it looks familiar. Well, they share, oddly enough, even though all those studios are right there, um, and you know they'd be in competition. You would have movies that were, from my understanding, that were you know being made by say MGM, but they would sometimes use other companies' lots. They would sometimes shoot on Universal and stuff like oh, that. I'm sure. sure they had to pay them, but I mean, I always thought that was weird. I figured they'd be like, no, you can't use ours. Get your own. <laughs> oh, they actually still do that. That's not, yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a thing. I mean, Sony yeah. and Disney with, with, with Spider-Man, it's the same, you know, you, you pay a certain amount, but you know, you still get access. I remember I was at the Warner Brothers tour and um, they were actually shooting the Muppets, the one with Jason Siegel. So oh. is that Warner Brothers? Nice. I was going to yeah. say too, why didn't, so the one side of, um, Fred's scarf got stuck in the door. Why didn't he just like pull off the other side of the scarf? <laughs> yeah. Is it just me? Uh, I guess he's, he's a choker. He's a thing. choker. He was liking it. He didn't actually want to get out of it. True. <laughs> he's so self-loathing because of Rod Serling's like opening thing. He's yeah. like. He's a pointless it. man. A meaningless yes. man. <laughs> Undistinguished sack of shit. <laughs> yes. Well, if my life's not worth anything, I might as well just let myself, you know, be taken out by scarf. Yeah, Die that like was a, a really punk. slow elevator, too. By the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slow so elevator in history. Like a few minutes. Like, oh no! Oh no! <laughs> hell! Hell! Where are those? It's, it's like uh, a little tight. <laughs> it's um, it's like uh, what's his face from uh, Mad TV is in front of the steamroller. And it's like way the hell oh, down yeah. the line in Austin Powers, and it's like, it's like no, yeah. <laughs> um, Get out of the way. Move. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. (laughs) No, I was going to say, but yeah, I like, um, at first I'm like, okay, so Bordeaux is just scared of this guy. He knows this guy pretty well. Maybe he doesn't know him on a personal by personal basis. But when he gave him the pair of scissors, I'm like, uh, I was like, what the, what the hell is going on here? And I was just really kind of, is is he going to save him or is there something more to this? And I'm like, oh, we'll probably find out in the second act. So. But it, I mean, it, it, here, here's the thing that I'll talk about, and I'm just going to throw it out there. When we get into the second act, it's a story to me personally. It's a story of a man who's a who's an addict, but keeps wanting the taste. Like if you like heroin or something like that, you think you can get off of it, but you're always wanting to go back and have that taste of heroin. That's kind of where I was going with with uh, how this episode kind of continues. So I don't know if you I guys agree. agree. Yeah, uh, I, I would say that the one thing that kind of got me was from Perdo's perspective. It seemed mm-hmm. like it was heading down the road of he becomes like the not the stoolie, but kind of the 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 guy that he always goes to all the time for for stuff. And oh, if I don't, if you don't give me what I want, I'm gonna kick your ass. And basically, like you know, kind of a bully relationship, I guess, because mm-hmm. you have this gift, etc. Like you know, you would do a you know a nerd in school to do your homework and stuff. Yeah, it's like it's and like Trey's addiction to corn. You know, I just can't get her off of it. She has to always have that taste. Help it. I'm from the Midwest. Yeah. Give me them a break. Them cobs, man. Them cobs. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I understand. We're working um, through it, though. It's going to be okay. We're here for you. Uh, yeah, well, thank That's you. why I brought Jacob. That's actually really why I brought Jacob on the podcast. It wasn't even about Twilight Zone. It was about oh, the sponsor. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> can't help you. it, man. Been around J- corn J- my whole uh, life. <laughs> Jacob, <laughs> Jacob's whole, uh, his whole motto is pop, pop, pop till you drop. <laughs> Then shouldn't he be the one that's having the intervention if he's having the pop, pop, pop till you drop? <laughs> no, that's, 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 he, he pops you till you drop. Like he pops you a corn. And... You want me Anyways, to I'm going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go as well as I thought it was going to go. So it's okay. Pop, pop, pop. Till you're dropping it. <laughs> <laughs> he's got Jeff behind him. <laughs> oh, man. My name's Jeff. My name's Jeff. My name's Jeff. Um, so. Act two, all right. So I don't think two, that I um, would sound like that. 
I feel like that I, I don't just cut you off, but I feel like that I would, no, would talk something like this. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jeff. <laughs> I'm sorry I cut you off. Continue, please. <laughs> Man of a thousand voices down here, folks. It's a ground. Blink, you want us to... <laughs> stop, stop, make it stop. <laughs> you have dry eyes. <laughs> Here's clear. Okay, look, eyes. you already used this joke and freaked, and it was much better done there. So did I? Oh yeah, I did. Yeah. Anytime uh, I see big ass eyeballs, I think of uh, Ben Stern. So asses have big eyeballs. Holy shit! They. So oh bad. yeah, Ben. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Do you have? Oh, guys, gone off the rails again. Um, oh my god. So continue with Act Two. Um, I have a question for you. Act so two, this opens with the second this, act. I know the se- this Sorry. second Perdo. Um, I have to ask you: Did uh, Fred stalk Perdo? Is that how he figures out how to where he's living at? Because he oh, somehow yeah. is in the. I was room. say, how to f- did he get his address? He didn't even know who he, he was. He just sitting in the room smoking a cigarette. It's like the most amazing <laughs> yeah. kind of job. Like he was James Bond in, in Casino Royale, just waiting in that room when he yeah. walked in. All right, all right. It's like how did who's got the superpowers here? How did you? You don't even know my name. Well, you know, he's gotten the dirty end of the stick for so long. He knows how to get what he wants. That apparently there it is you know there's benefits to that dirty end of the stick i yeah. guess <laughs> he's had it looking him in the face for way too long <laughs> that dirty end of the stick's been right next to my puss all these years exactly you know each other I'm so sick of smelling hand. the dirty end of the stick to the moon you bastard jump at the moon <laughs> Oh, man. so this is also where my audio for this episode went out of sync by the way i don't know what's i, I don't know. know what's going on with paramount plus again but you need to fix your audio problems because it is disgusting it is messed up and uh um, i will stick. pay you next month for the next month of paramount so anyways perdo drops all his garbage on the ground all his stuff and fred kicks perdo stuff like an asshole and yeah. um Basically, to kind of like boil it down, Fred is going on a addict trip, a kind of gangster trip where he's going to pressure Perdo every single day to give him what he needs. And Perdo is content. He's like, oh, you should use your things or whatever. And Perdo is content with just doing it on a small scale, giving the bottles of cleaners and stuff like that. You know, if you're Perdo and you know exactly what what he needs wouldn't you kind of just give it to him on the offset and kind of run out of the room and maybe go down to the street that may be slick and give him some shoes is it because you can do it in like only a certain time of order like i i just i don't know like i think it's, it's weird like it, it takes like three days for him to finally get to his final conclusion i, I think mean in, in all i'm sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say like each day he gives him something it seems like he's only allowed like one thing per day or it was supposed to be like a one-time deal and maybe hmm. power wise there's something there i don't know well i think we're you know honest and, and all all jokes aside I don't know. but um he because he even says in the end you see like he's remorseful for doing what he has to do he doesn't want to kill the guy yeah um, but he sees that oh he's gonna kill me or have we gotten to that part yet oops anyway he sees that he's going to take him out so he's like i don't want anything to do with this guy because he's gonna kill me and he keeps on trying to give him things to maybe send him down another road, but he probably maybe he's like hoping, okay, if I give him this thing, maybe that'll make him happy, and then the fates will change, and I won't see him killing me anymore. But he keeps on seeing he's killing right. me, so he's finally, like, I don't want to do it, man, but it's you or me. So, I mean, yeah, you're young and I'm old, but <laughs> I, I don't actually die till 1973. So get this, you're done. There you go. <laughs> well, and the thing too is with like the money, you know, I'm sure he probably thought, okay, this guy is a greedy bastard. Maybe if I give him like a way to to you know make money and you know one time off and call it good maybe that will satiate him on the off chance and that probably does play into what nick was saying a minute ago about like addicts uh, not just like drug addicts but addicts of anything and greed Mm -hmm. he's hoping that hey i'll give him this and it will it's not what he really needs but it's what he wants and maybe he'll leave me alone but like any addict you give them a taste they're going to come back for more if you don't they don't get what they want they're going to get hostile and I think he finally just decides, well, this isn't working. I can't, I'm, I'm in this spot now I can't get out of, and this guy's going to be my end. So got to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause he, well, at first he, uh, he gives him a pen that's leaking 
and it automatically leaks onto the the papers, which um, give the horse racing or whatever the the who's gonna win. So he wins two hundred fifty dollars, and I don't know if you saw this trip. I don't even know if you saw this, Jacob, but he asked the bellhop for a paper for your tomorrow's paper, or whatever, and it's the same exact paper from Time Enough at Last. I so was, it talks about the H bomb. I was gonna mention. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Sorry. It's all right. No, race no, no. that. What did I do? <laughs> trip? Go no, 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 no. It's fine. Say it. No, no, it's the same newspaper from uh, Time Enough at Last. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I read yeah. that, but I, I hadn't seen that episode yet, so. Oh, well, there you go. I didn't catch it. <laughs> I read it. Well, just remember, there might be an H-bomb in Time Enough at Last. I can't guarantee that, but there might, <laughs> there <laughs> might be an and, H-bomb in it. I'll try and purge that information from my mind. <laughs> <laughs> just watch whatever that uh, Karen movie you're talking me about. Yeah, there oh. you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. But there's another thing, too, in there with the paper. Yeah. Um, on the on the page with all the racing information Mm -hmm. there's a bunch of in jokes um with the names of the jockeys which included sterling clemens uh hogton which is the uh producer buck hogton uh butler which was the set director and denault um which was referencing an assistant director so nice nice but he wins 250 dollars and receives the tomorrow's newspaper does exactly what's happened to me many many times where I asked for a tip and they slammed the door in my face. So that's 100% <laughs> truthful. I'll give it that much. And he tries to do it again, but the pen doesn't leak. So he calls the uh, Perdo a crumb bomb. So there's another vocabulary word you can put in your <laughs> lexicon. <missed> <laughs> he calls him a crumb bomb. So <laughs> there you yeah, go. By the time list. we're done. <laughs> um, actually, when we at some point, we should rank the rank the sayings, rank the expressions or whatever. When we get about halfway through, there's 150. 60 episodes approximately so when we're around 75 i feel like we'll have a, a big enough of vocabulary so where we can have a whole show where we only use phrases like that from back <laughs> i <in> like that <laughs> uh, we'll make it like a cryptic cryptic episode about crumb bombs and you know flying and jump to the moon and all that garbage this guy's a crumb bomb <laughs> <laughs> i actually took guys a... both in the puss yeah. <laughs> I actually place. took more notes for this than anything because um, it was just so much about like the different things we were saying. Because he even says, uh, even Fred says, I was born under a lousy zodiac sign. I'm like, yeah, it was the 50s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's no different. You hear people say stuff like that, like, you know, oh, my sign tells me that I'm supposed to be cranky or whatever it might be. So mm-hmm. there's people that still go by that shit today. Oh, yeah. And then there's people that try and like, they, they have the apps and everything and they will like joking like say oh, i don't really believe it but they'll like sit there and check it every day and go through yeah. it and kind of sort of let it alter their life a little bit yeah just more than a little bit funny. <laughs> good for you <laughs> thanks but no thanks um but he he this is where the episode kind of concludes he actually the uh, Perdo is actually assisting another person giving what they need or whatever i can't remember what it is that he gives them the, the other person anyways when he when he's getting ready to close up his box that's when fred's behind him like jason Voorhees or some shit and um <laughs> <laughs> he says he says fred threatens is i put it, fred threatens him and tells him to look deep and tell him what he what and tell him what's for tomorrow and uh Perdo's like i can't supply what you really need fred which is serenity humor and peace of mind which is basically Perdo saying you have taken this too far and you're never going to be happy yeah i know it's like my note exactly to that very thing says mm. sounds like what fred needs is to not be a dick yep <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's exactly that's the best way to put it you know without saying it in the episode because he probably got censored for it but it also means it's like when you win like the lottery and you're still not happy because you need more it's like the jeff bezos or Elon Musk, who keep yeah. making money and they just don't have enough money, you know, that type of thing. So, but this is when Fred decides he's going to, you know, go into his box, the uh, Perdo's box, and it's where he finds a pair of shoes. And um, I'm like, okay, I, I kind of see where this is going. These shoes are going to be used at a funeral for Fred because I, I got that feeling that he was going to die in this episode just by the shoes and they're mm-hmm. really nice shoes and he's wearing a suit. So maybe that's how they're going to end it and him in a, a box of some sort. What I didn't see coming is he chases uh, he chases after Prado. The shoes are very slick because they have very slick soles, and he actually gets hit by a car. Yeah. That's fine. And they actually I show like, him being hit by a car, which yeah, is kind of like, I was yeah, like, they did. Shit. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah did. they like legit. It's like it's really goofy looking, but it, they definitely showed it. <laughs> that sped but, up car. 
Uh, not I only love the that, 50s for that. I mean, and I was like you guys said, they actually showed the whole thing because they got that and they were like, we're, we're rolling with this. We're mm-hmm. keeping it in there. But the, he, that car hit him and it was all sped up. And even he him being sped up was the funniest part. But <laughs> not only did it hit him, it hit his ass. They didn't break. They didn't slow down. Nope. They didn't. They definitely didn't stop. They did just, just rolled right through like his ass wasn't there. They just kept <laughs> fucking going. <laughs> like, I mean, like they didn't even like hit the brakes. Like, oh, what did I just hit? And then go drive off. No, they just. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome. Yeah, that was great. They got the uh, the dirty end of the stick one last time, and that was the dirty end of a front car. Oh no, no, he hasn't even gotten the dirty end of the stick because that's coming next. The funny <laughs> part about the whole segment. It's not really funny because this is when I'm like, holy shit. Perdoe's on the side of the street, and this is where we get the explanation of what exactly Perdoe can see. He saw his own death by the hands of Fred, who is constantly begging him for more shit, which means he did all this because he was trying to find a way to get out of his own death, which he saw by strangulation, which is pretty messed up. And he kind of just walks away from the incident, and then that's when it, I'll get to the end, but... I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was a brilliant way to set up the whole payoff to this episode where Fred was going to be, it's like watching, once again, watching Quantum Leap again. I keep going back to the Quantum Leap, but it's like knowing what's going to happen next, causing the person that is going to cause the death to die, saving yourself. So it's like actually Final Destination almost a little bit. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned Quantum Leap. I just got to say. I do that a lot. Dean Stockwell. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. (laughs) R.I.P. Ziggy. Not Ziggy. All right. He'll always be Al for me. I know he's been in a whole lot more, but he's always. Yeah, no, no. But I have to. (laughs) No, but I have to ask you guys like that moment when he reveals everything. Did you guys go, holy shit, like I did? Or did you just kind of see it coming? Did you know that's what it was kind of leaning towards? What was your guys' overall take on that? Because I was like, holy crap, that's that's amazing. That's one of the best kind of written ways to end an episode, just kind of. Go dark, go forward and fast. Literally. And parts of it, you know, you could kind of see. I I saw bits of it. I didn't see the 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 exactly what was gonna happen. He knew that it was gonna once he got hit, it's like, okay, there's more to it. He saw more than what he was letting on. You know, and even the way he grabbed the shoes out, he took it by force. So you knew mm. that it was either he was screwing with powers beyond his control, or there was more to the what Perdose saw than what he let on. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, I saw the whole thing. The whole, I'm not going to be one of them six sense people. <laughs> I knew it all along, but um, I, <laughs> I, I knew, like, I think I mentioned earlier that early on, I felt like he saw something bad. he didn't want to do this guy. And I was like, mm-hmm. it's probably his death. I didn't really think that it was Perdoe's death until closer to the end. I didn't even really know it was for sure his death that he saw that, that idea maybe of like, skimmed my brain but it wasn't really there that wasn't predominant i thought that he saw this guy's death and he didn't want to give him that thing and maybe that would lead you to think well maybe everything in his little bag of tricks leads someone down a path to where they get something and he didn't want to give him this thing because this thing would lead him down a path to where he'd die and maybe yeah. whatever he's, that's what he's supposed to have and i was like okay yeah these shoes because he's like freaking out about it those shoes because he was even like please don't don't take those i was like yeah because I did feel like he was going to die. Not Perdo, but uh, Renard. I felt like he was going to die. And he just didn't realize it. But then I did think it was pretty hardcore when uh, when he started to slip. And then you kind of saw like uh, Perdo's face yeah. change. I was like, uh-oh, no. He knew <laughs> what he was doing this time. And he was like, yeah, I saw you. He was going to kill me. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want it to go down this way. But yeah, you forced my hand. You're out. And I, I did think that was, I liked, I mean, I don't need everything to be dark. But I do think it's kind of refreshing when you have something like Twilight Zone, which has dark endings. But even its mm. dark endings will sometimes be a little kind of, you know, 1950s goofy. I felt like this shit was just straight dark. Yeah. And I <laughs> it was a nice, was it like, was, yeah. He just like changed his like kind of the whole time he's been like this little old man going, oh, oh. And he was like, Mm-mm, you're done. <laughs> and it's like, I, I, you're dead. <laughs> I feel like you guys feel like we're, Someone made him mad. He's like, hey, you know what I'm going to do? Ha, ha, ha. It's Christmas. 
last episode of the year. Let's just go down and let's just go down in flames. If this episode kills us, we'll we'll go down in flames doing it. And uh, it turned out to be one of the uh, most interesting episodes of the series for me so far. So, like I said, depending on I guess in the end how you guys uh, look at it when it comes to the uh, episode, and if you kind of get the get the kind of Easter the egg pieces that are the breadcrumbs that are leading because he's leaving a lot of breadcrumbs in this episode to kind of where it's going to lead. I guess you can pick it up. But I was just like, to me personally, just on a uh, just kind of coming from the episode, I was like, yeah, I guess it's Christmas. This is, uh, I'm pretty sure he was like, uh, you know what? Screw it. Let's do it. And actually there's a, there's a one episode that he does where he, he, I don't know if he wrote it or not, but it's the, they shot it on videotape, but it was the one with the Santa Claus who, Night of the Meek, that's what it was with the Santa Claus episode. And that's actually a pretty dark episode too. So, and it's, you know, for what it's doing, but to end the episode out, it basically, they're, they're, taking the body of fred away and these this wife and husband come out of the room or come out from their apartment or whatever and uh they're like oh my god what happened blah 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 and uh <laughs> i think Perdosa is like what, what do you need and he's like I, I, what do you mean what i need he hands up a comb no charge and um the man and woman are asked to take this is really strange the man and woman are just asked to take pictures in front of a crime scene <laughs> like the scene like this i'm like um i was like okay sure and he's like oh we'll take a picture and the man uses a comb and that's when the episode ends and then we see the shot of fred shoes but i love that I, I by the way yeah. how shoes, um yeah. back in the oh no the, the comb thing oh. how back in the 50s and 60s like people cared enough to where they're like hey we're taking your pictures it's like quick honey make yourself look presentable we're <laughs> we're gonna be in the paper and like nowadays it's like oh somebody's not just gonna be in the paper but they're gonna have like a news thing done on them and we get people that look like the guy from the bedroom intruder video on there hide your kids <laughs> hide your wife and stuff they look like the guy off of <laughs> don't be a menace to south central while drinking your juice in the hood it's just crazy <laughs> i'm like you know back then people actually cared <laughs> yeah well and it was it, more of novelty because it was a relatively new thing at that point to like the news that not the not the photography thing but just the you know yeah being oh in the paper is a big deal <laughs> yeah well, it's funny too, because I, you know, sometimes I'll go, like if I ha I'm looking for a new job, I walk into an interview. You know, I've always been under the assumption you kind of dress like you know, dress pants and a shirt or something like that. It used to be you wear a tie. Mm -hmm. Now people just walk in in jeans and a t-shirt, and usually they get the job. It's crazy. The world changed yeah, since true. COVID, though. Dude, that's sh well, that shit. I I I hired people for years in a, another life. And I always said that I was always, I know we're going off topic a little bit, but I was always like, if you can't, I don't expect you to dress in a suit or whatever. And, and I, like, especially every day coming into work, depending on what job I was working at. But I was like, if you're going to come in and like flip flops and a t-shirt, and then I got you here and this guy over here who he at least took the time to like put something on presentable, mm -hmm. be it a suit, be it just like khakis in a polo or something whatever man that that says something right there about that guy he cares enough to know or he's at least smart enough to know that hey i need to make myself presentable or he's not you know such a douchebag that he's like you should hire me regardless because i've run into those people before too it doesn't matter what oh, i yeah. look like it matters what i do i was like eh. <laughs> that shows a little bit about your character that you just don't give a shit <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, but yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it coincides with what you're talking about. Like, he's literally being taken pictures in front of crime scene. He's like, honey, like, it makes my hair is combed down. And they actually look back, you know, kind of like surprised by that. But it, that's how the episode ends. It ends with the murder, of, uh, or not the murder, the death of Fred, uh, what the hell is his last name? Bernard. And, uh, oh, Perdoe, yeah, Fred. Yeah, <laughs> Fred and uh, Renard and uh, basically Perdoe kind of leaving off for the sunset, I guess. We noticed the closing narration for this episode is oh, shit. I didn't considerably talk about that. shorter than the opening narration. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. Sing us out, Jacob. Oh, okay, yeah, he got it all out. And then and by the time he got to the end, he was like, okay, I'm done. I'm good. I got it all out. Because <laughs> all he had to say for the closing narration was street scene, night, traffic accident, victim named Fred Renard, gentleman with a sour face to whom contentment came with difficulty. Fred Renard, who took all that was needed in the Twilight Zone. Dirty old stick, all that was needed. I wonder if he had that sour <laughs> look on his face when he was dead. Possibly. He was dead. Yeah. I mean, if he died that way, probably. Yeah. yeah. Did they pull the stick close. out, though? That's what I want to know. That's why I was dirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask, um, with this whole entire episode now finally completed, mm -hmm. was talking about it. Let me know if there's other stuff you want to talk about that I missed, because I know I do miss stuff. 
what did you guys think? What did you think of the overall episode? Did, is there anything you want to talk about that I missed? Uh, what was your overall uh, final opinions? I'd let T Money go first. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, you let the snowman go first. <laughs> Um, the one thing that I noticed after the credits when they went on to show the next episode, like he's talking about the next episode, which is like uh, the four of us are dying or something like that. But at the very end, he winks at the camera when he says something about this one's made for goosebumps. And I thought that was really cool. I know that's not exactly an episode thing, but it was kind of kind of a cool little extra. But yeah, the, this actual episode, it went by. I don't know if it was this this way for you guys, but it went by so fast. Like I look down and all of a sudden it's like, how are we at the halfway point already? Well, that's the thing about Twilight Zone in general. If the episode's good, even though it's only like 22 minutes long, so it's it's going to go quick either way until we get to season four. But <laughs> it's um season five. Anyways, if the episode's good enough, it goes quick. I mean, like like this episode, it's just it's amazing how an episode that is only 22 minutes long can feel long, but an episode like this. It feels like it's five minutes long because I was taking oh, yeah. notes and writing down my thoughts on the episode. And I look up and the, I was like, oh, my God, it's already halfway through the f- episode. And I'm like, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird how the Twilight Zone operates in your brain when it comes to watching it. Yeah, well, it was an engaging episode. There's no doubt. Like overall, yeah. I'm, I'm happy Perdo did what he did because, you know, the guy was an absolute dick. Exactly. It did flip. I mean, it was. It was a bit of a shorter episode of 22 minutes, like you said, but it did go by really quick. And it definitely went back quick, by quicker than uh, so far the 16 millimeter shrine, because that one is dragging. Yeah, there's not much that happens in that episode. I know I'm a little behind, but so for context, it's faster than that episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, did you have like any, I, I guess I should ask you as well, Jacob, did you have any like uh, anything you wanted to add to the episode that I didn't talk about? What, what was your overall just take on the episode in general, I guess that's what say. I mean, I, I thought it was a good episode. Um, I, it was a really enjoyable episode. Mm-hmm. And while it definitely had its, I mean, so far, I think it had its subtext to a degree. I think it was less about that, just more about having a neat little hook and like a, a, a fun little interesting hook and where they go with it. So it wasn't, it didn't have like all this like real deep stuff to think about and talk about or as much as some of the episodes do i found it to be a really enjoyable episode though is it the best one i've ever seen no but it is way far from the the worst i'd say it is it's on the better side of of the episodes for sure i thought it was a really neat little take the ending dev as goofy as the car hit looks the whole the inflection behind the ending and behind the motive the uh the actions and everything i think was really did elevate the episode up to that point i was like i mean it's it, it's cool it's fine I'm, I'm 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 digging this it's i'm entertained but then that ending how they just kind of took a bit of a dark turn i was like okay yeah that that cap right there was perfect and that just elevated it up quite a few notches in my in my book yeah it's um it's an episode that is very fascinating i say fascinating a lot in my reviews for some reason but it's fascinating because it has it's a very clear message on what it's trying to do and it doesn't overstay its welcome it doesn't feel like an episode that insults your intelligence and it's doing a very interesting uh, kind of runaround about a guy who literally has no redemptive uh redemptive arc to him he's just an asshole kind of like the guy from escape clause who in, in in his essence just does a really disgusting thing to this guy who literally is like a gift giver to people so he is like a santa claus but he has like a mysticism to him and the fact that he just he's killed it almost feels like a relief because you know you've ever watched like a horror film with let's say like children of the corn or village of the damned or something like that where you have like the actually trolls another one for some reason i keep thinking about where the the tense nature of the of the movie or the episode kind of keeps you keeps your like stress and blood level blood level raised and then you get the final payoff and you just like let a big sigh of relief off. And that's what happens here. And it's just almost like an expertly paced episode. Now, whether it's the best episode I've ever seen, that's not even close, but I think it does a pretty admirable job with giving us a character that has a lot of dimension and then giving us another character who's kind of um, just never going to have any redeeming value. And that's a good kind of like yin and yang, I guess you could say. I do wonder what it would be like if 
like because by the time like you said by the time that this guy gets mm-hmm. off renard gets run over by this car you kind of want to like be like fuck yeah i hate that guy <laughs> you want him gone and even though effectively perdo murdered him <laughs> i mean <laughs> or led to his death he knowingly made this man go to his death you're okay with it you're like it's fine you do not look at him any differently you think oh it's justified it needed to happen but i do wonder like if we hadn't if he was not such a shithead, what would it have been like if if uh, Renard had not been a douche? If he was the the um the guy in the beginning, the baseball player who wasn't a bad guy, but he was um whatever reason something he was going to do if he was given the thing he needed, he would end up killing Perdo. How interesting that would have been if he wasn't a raging ass. He was a good guy, but he was still going to lead to his death. How would he, what decision would he make then? Would he still make the decision to take him out because he's going to lead to his death, but he maybe doesn't deserve it? So making Renard kind of like a raging douche made it a little bit more digestible for us, the audience, to see yeah. him get taken yeah. out. Yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, <laughs> you said it before. I'm actually glad you brought Final Destination because there is a lot of Final Destination in a lot of these episodes, but that's the concept of. You know, these, these kids in Final Destination, for the most part, are not bad kids. I mean, you have your dickish kids, but they're not. They're just kids. They're bad. They're, they, they're kids that do kids do. They see premonitions, and they, unfortunately, are killed off as this movie goes along. But that's the same kind of thing. It's like, I think you have a more um, comfortable sense of just not being truly upset that the guy was killed off compared to, like you said, if the guy was killed off. So I don't think he feels bad, even though it's a really, really messed up situation. And either way you look at it, it does make it feel more, like you said, digestible or more comfortable that you're not going to feel bad at the end of the day about Frank uh, Renaud's character, just because he would have killed, he would have killed Perdo. So it's just kind of like the, the switch off there. So I do. Like I said, though, I mean, I liked the episode. I just think it would have been more thought provoking and a bit more interesting mm. if Renard wasn't an ass, because then we'd be like, oh, and yeah, I know you go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I, I think we get so many of those kinds of episodes. Yeah. You know, I and not that that's bad. I, I think it's just for this kind of a thing to talk into 22 minutes, you would have had to stuff a lot more into this or sure. start earlier. Obviously, the whole the whole dynamic of it would have been different. But we get so many of those episodes that are, you know, morally you know we get very few that are morally black and white yeah yeah yeah. Um, I but no understood it would have been had it come down to that you know what would have happened where would it have gone and it would have made for an interesting thought exercise if nothing else or it does make for an interesting thought exercise so and i mean then of course rod serling wouldn't have been able to vicariously kill off whoever it was that wronged him yeah exactly (laughs) Well, well, let me ask you. Let me actually ask you this question: What if uh, Frank Renard started, started out as just a a guy down on his luck? He he's not a bad guy. He just maybe lost his job or something like that. And through the episode, he became. I mean, became more and more kind of out of control. Would you felt that would have worked better, or do you just want him to be a completely good guy in the end? I think that would have been interesting too, because it would have mm-hmm. like if he was a good guy, and then maybe because of Perdo's gifts and trying mm-hmm. to alter fate maybe he made it brought greed into his life that wasn't there before and it made him go down a road and he became an ass because of it because then the question would be was he always an ass and he just hadn't had an opportunity to be an ass and to display it and also we would have felt okay with him being taken out like we do but then we'd be like how do we feel about Perdo? Because he led this guy not only to his death, but he led a good person to be a bad person, even though he didn't mean to. I don't know. But like Triff said, there's a lot of those moral dilemmas in the Twilight Zone. And when I just sit here and think about the, the episode on its own, I'm like, yeah, I'd love to have that kind of depth and, and all that. But really, when watching all the episodes back to back to back, I think that it would be kind of fresh to kind of have just, like she said, a a black and white episode. It's like, hey, this guy's a dick. This guy's nice. He's got to go. And we got a little twist of fate there, but he's still a dick. <laughs> <laughs> On the, the well, idea of addiction being one of those things that, you know, plays in with the way that Perdo's character is structured, I think, I don't think you would have had that because it always is supposed to give you what you need. Yeah. And unless you force it, because like, Half the reason I think he got killed off was he was forcing the shoe thing. You know, he was like, oh, what? I just walk in this direction and then that that's all it takes. You know, mm-hmm. he didn't just let stuff happen. 
And maybe had he let stuff happen, maybe it wouldn't have turned out that same way. So with the premise of what Perdo's powers are, I kind of feel like it wouldn't have, unless he, unless uh, Renault would have misused them. I don't know that it would have led him down that road, the way that things are structured with this. There's probably also a little bit of, you know, too much of a good thing, you know, be happy with what you have. And like he said, everybody gets one thing. You all get the one thing that you need. And that one thing, if it's the thing you truly need, it may seem small and insignificant, like the bottle of cleaning fluid. Um, (laughs) But that small bottle led this woman to, we hypothesize and presume a happy life. She met the man who she's probably, you know, we all went down that road, probably think, oh, this is the guy they're going to get together and go there and yada, yada, yada. So because of that small bottle of cleaner, she ended up with a totally different life. And it doesn't sound like Renard was allowing that to happen. He didn't get the two hundred and fifty dollars, yeah. and that's what got him back on his feet, or something, you know. Yeah, it was he the control thing. More. He wanted more, yeah. more, more. He didn't care where the things he got took him. He just wanted more things. Mm-hmm. There's an episode called Mr. Beavis, which is considered like one of the worst <laughs> episodes ever created. It's the same thing, like <laughs> exactly. He's like I need TV for my bundle. <laughs> that's all he needs. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> what do you need? TV for my bundle. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about it's basically about a guy who is very is very nice but has a lot of problems and he has all that luck you know given to him and blah 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 but I, that that's kind of where i think this episode could have gone but didn't i guess you i guess you could say in the end so yeah you know what it kind of reminds me of um was one for the angels where uh the that death keeps getting all kinds of stuff like i just imagine him getting all this stuff and not knowing what to do with it kind of sort of that visual comes to mind but i don't know why it doesn't make any sense sorry yeah like he's got all this shit in his bag and he's like i mean i guess this is going somewhere but i don't know who the hell it's going to mm-hmm. until he meets that person and says what do you need and they look at him and he gets the oh, wah, 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 wah. i was like okay now <laughs> i know where the cleaning fluid goes <laughs> i mean just overall i think to kind of conclude unless you guys you guys have anything else you wanted to say on the episode at all well, originally well, this was, it was like the original story appeared in the 1952 um, TV yeah. show. And it was based off of a machine that granted um, what you needed versus a homeless guy or a, a seller. Oh, yeah, a homeless exactly. guy. Yeah, the or homeless, a peddler. Homeless guy. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of it. Yeah, he had a home because that guy tracked him down and went. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> Overall, I think it, it, it does work. Like I said, in the scheme of things, whether this is like an episode that's ranked 100 or it's an episode that's ranked 10, um, this is going to depend on. But I think it definitely is, you know, in our top half, maybe if we come down to it. But um, I think overall, I think it, it definitely succeeds what it's trying to do and does something really interesting. But I'm on, I'm also with, you know, Jacob on the, he's just, he's a little bit too much of a dick and it kind of, I don't know. It's almost like guilty pleasure type of episode thing type of thing. Yeah, and you kind of know, man. You know, this guy's being they're ramming home that he's such a raging asshole. I, yeah. One of two things are going to happen. Either A, there's going to be some redemptive arc, which by the time you get to the end, you're like, nope, that's not it. Or B, he's he's got to go. Or, or exactly. Something. Yeah, you, you kind of, it's not a huge surprise when he dies. It's just a surprise how he dies. Mm-hmm. Right. Or the reason. See, and that's what it. makes this one stand out to me is because it did do that. It kind of went to that place where most people wouldn't. Yeah. So, I mean, that. it's going to rank high for me personally because of, because of that fact, if not, I mean, other facts too, but mainly that fact. So with that said, um, I guess that's kind of where we'll leave the episode. I think we're all in agreement. It's a pretty decent episode for Twilight Zone, especially for our first season, you know, 12 episodes in. But we'll go to the last segment until we come up with something more to increase the, the time of this episode, which I'm sure I'll figure out something. But right now we have the list, which uh, I started last last week. I started posting like a screenshot of the video of what, you know, where the ranking list is at. But uh, right now we have walking distance at number one. Number 11 is a 16 millimeter shrine. The question I'll ask both of you guys, whoever wants to go first. I don't know how much you feel comfortable participating jacob at the moment because i know you said you're trying to catch up is this episode better than escape clause that's my first thing that's where that's where i'll start off at i feel like it is but that's just me quickly i gotta but i thought we ranked last week's and when the sky was opened under the lonely 
Was that wrong? I don't know. It doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead with what you're saying. Troy. Oh, no. I'm just going to say I, I think it's better than Escape Clause. That's me. Escape Clause is the one with the devil, right? Yep. Yeah. I remember. The, see, I remember the devil. I don't remember anything else about the episode. I remember the devil, and I remember him being like really over the top and like entertaining. That's about all I remember. I don't know. I think, man, compared, I mean, based on the ones I've seen, not counting 16 millimeter shrine, it's better than that <laughs> one. Um, and I'm not even done with it, but because six and seven and when the sky was opened and the lonely are the two that I have seen recently. And I think it was better than, and when the sky was opened, but that's what I was thinking. I was like the lonely, I, I don't know. I like, I think I like, okay, I think I like the episode like on its own individual, just its viewing experience. I like this one better than those two, but I liked what the lonely, all the thought provoking questions the lonely brought up. True. I thought it had like some deeper questions that you ask yourself and you ask about the, the characters and, and what's going on and like some, some really good questions and deep stuff to think about there. But honestly, I guess since, you know, your messaging can be great, but if your delivery is a little off, which the delivery of this one, I think is better than those two. <laughs> so I'm going to say it is above and when the sky was opened, but I don't know about escape well, clause, which absolutely does not answer any of the questions you asked. <laughs> no, that's fine. Like I said, we'll get, we'll get to you. We'll, you'll get caught up eventually. So it's not a big deal. Don't I think the reason we put it in when the sky was open at number six is it's a little bit better to me. Per I think we all I, I know you you like the lonely with what was going on, but I think there was a little bit more than the lonely when the sky was open. Maybe a little more meat on the bone. I guess you could say it, it really. It, to be fairly honest, when this list gets to like a hundred episodes, it's really going to be it's difficult. You're, you're, yeah, mm -hmm. you're going down to like the minutia details, but. I, well, that I and I think I, I think that that's that's the same thing as I was talking. I think that's why wow. I did agree and say sky was open was above lonely because its delivery was better than the lonely. The lonely, yeah, had like some bumpy delivery, even though it had a better message. And the delivery is more important to me, so I'm cool with that. Yeah, um, the delivery of Alicia was was better. Oh, his delivery on Alicia. <laughs> We didn't get to see. That's the director's cut. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> well, here, here's the, the question I actually have. <laughs> he shot her in the face. Let's not. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boy. Poor Alicia. May she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Rest in, rest rest in, in peace. pieces. Rest in pieces. <laughs> Rust in pieces. Uh, there, even better. That's our new episode title. Rest in pieces. Um, <laughs> here's what I have. I asked you this last week, I, and I'll ask you this again. Do you think the characters in this episode, Triv, are are they on the same level as the devil from Escape Clause and the guy who is the one who ends up murdering the, the his wife? Do you think these characters in this episode, are they on par or are they better than Escape Clause's characters? Because I'm going to be fairly honest, I still can't get over how good the devil was in Escape Clause. As much as we all know the devil is a terrible thing in creation but do you think Perdo is a much more interesting character a better character than the devil and do you think fred is a much more antagonist than the other guy i can't remember what the other guy's name was but that, that's where i'm leaning because here's where i'm going to lean at if you agree we'll put it right below perchance the dream because i still think perchance the dream is much better I don't know if you agree with that, or we could put it below escape clause and above when the next sky was open. Like, where do you, where do you see the, on that kind of spectrum? I mean, it's kind of six and one half dozen another, honestly, the, the devil is an intriguing character and he obviously is mm. one of the best characters we've run across thus far. The ending of this one to me, like I say, I, I will stand by. I think the ending comes at you out of left field. This episode was pretty refreshing to me and it, I don't know. I guess that's kind of where I sit. Character wise, I mean, the devil is definitely better, but overall, I mean, if it's if it's six or if it's or sorry, if it's five or if it's six, I mean, it's not going to make a huge difference. So, well, let me ask you this: Do you do you agree it's not as good as Perchance the Dream, or do you think it could go higher? I mean, I don't think it's as good. I don't think it's as good as Perchance, but I mm -hmm. I don't. Th there's such different episodes, but I, it's not above Perchance. Okay. It's really, this is really a tough one because I, I want to say I, I'm not going to die on the hill, but it's like, 
the the ending escape clause is like you said is so good but this one is like it, it, you almost see where escape clause is going to go but if you don't think about it you really don't see where um what episode were we talking about i just forgot uh <laughs> what what do you need where it's going to go so I, I guess we'll put it at number five. It's it's it, it really is. A you don't have to. Shoot. I just no no. But it's not it's not it. that. I'm trying to I'm trying to compare the two. Well, even if about, you see like, where it's going, I mean, yeah. I haven't seen Escape Clause all the time. But even if you see where an ending's going, that doesn't always necessarily mean that. Oh well, that totally invalidates how good the ending was. I mean, no no. I, I agree. I agree. Good. But, but I mean, like, granted, this ending was good. It yeah. did kind of make the episode. But I can't. All I remember about Escape Clause. Oh, no, you're day. good. Well, and the thing is, like mm-hmm. both endings, the the bad the the bad guys, the main the main antagonist gets their comeuppance, and I I I feel like the ending of this one is more solid. Like it, it just I don't know the fact that they show a guy being hit by a car as compared to dropping dead of a heart attack. I don't know. Let me ask you this: If they took that scene where the car runs over the guy, which is probably what maybe three seconds, maybe yeah. four seconds four or five seconds whatever and they put over it the benny hill song would that make any difference that would make it better i think that would actually. have made number yeah made it number one actually yeah, just exactly. loop it just loop it <laughs> wah, 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 wah. i mean i feel as if that could add something to the conversation yeah oh my god can you imagine if, if he did that that'd be incredible i'm telling you what um after listening to what you said yeah we're gonna make it number five because it, it really benny is hill was the argument decider exactly well actually that does make a good point no i'm just kidding uh no it, like what you were saying trev i think that you know i mean i always agree with you but that you made some good points you don't have it. to agree with me it's okay i'm not no, no. anyways um no <laughs> no no it has, not, has nothing to do with it fucking do what i say <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i you're um, not gonna hurt my avatar feelings if you don't agree with me it, it comes down to that ending to be fairly honest i think the ending um is much better i think i still think the devil is a much better character, but the ending I think really has the better payoff than Escape Clause. Like I said, Escape Clause, you know exactly where it's going to end. There's no surprise, but there's actually a surprise to what you need, whether you realize what's happening or not. And I think the surprise is what always makes Twilight Zone the a good show. Is for that simple, you can think you can see where it's going but it completely does a 180 and kind of smacks you in with the stick or whatever you guys are talking about and uh the dirty end um, of the stick exactly yeah <laughs> and i think that's what makes what you need a better episode in the end with the dirty stick so um dirty i, I stick have, makes a difference <laughs> exactly <laughs> dirty sticks so, and <laughs> exactly uh but yeah that we'll do that we'll leave it we'll put it at number five so it raises above escape clause so there you go um so with that said uh what you need is gonna be at number five uh number one is of course walking distance still number 12 is the 16 millimeter shrine soon to be the 16th number 16 for the 16th millimeter shrine i know i know are you just gonna leave it there forever because you know exactly probably not you really hate that episode (laughs) i mean we still got we got we we still got that baseball episode coming up here at some point oh the great casey yeah yeah, which I uh, do not like. So with that said, uh, that'll do it for this episode of uh, season one, episode 12, What You Need. The next episode is called The Four of Us Are Dying. Another episode I don't really remember very much, but it's the first episode of A New Decade, which is premiered on January 1st, 1960. Directed by John Brom. Uh, let see if anybody famous. Uh, Harry Towns is the only one I recognize. Phil Peter Bracco, maybe Dan Don Gordon. I don't know. We'll talk about it. It's written by Ross Sternley again, based off a, another story. So that's going to do it on this episode. Uh, Jacob, thank you once again for coming on as well. Uh, where can they find you if they want to find your dirty stick? Well, wow. <laughs> if we're looking for my dirty stick, <laughs> my OnlyFans is no. Okay, so you can find me <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, is where I spend most of my time at Jacob Anders Reviews, where I review movies every day, some movies you've heard of, and quite a few movies you've never heard of. Um, and also I do series like comic book movie reviews and video game movie reviews. I'm also on Twitter at, what the hell's my name? At Red Neville 2. And I go on there and I talk about the movies that I talk about on YouTube. And that's and, about uh <laughs> 
you have a i don't know if this will air before your comic book but you're doing their next episodes of spider-man episode i'm hearing uh yeah comic book this yeah it should be probably yeah right after this episode it's going to be the third spider-man tv show from the 70s movie I didn't wow. even know they had that many. It's called the Dragon's Challenge. <laughs> I'm actually watching that not tomorrow, but the next day. I think. I think there's kung fu in it. The uh, question is, will there be any bird poop like there was in the original Spider-Man movie? I, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. It's a few years <laughs> later. <laughs> maybe they're in Japan, so maybe there'll be like some. I don't know what's an animal. Stork over poop. There? Koala bears. <laughs> yeah. some, some ko- koalas over there. Sure. No, pandas. Panda poop. It'll be panda poop. <laughs> oh, God. It might not be in Japan. I'm just, I'm projecting here. Dragon's Challenge. I saw somebody standing like this on the front of it. Nice. Have no idea. Th- those movies are kind of out there. So, yeah, check they that out, be. too. <laughs> if you want to see OG Spider-Man, the MCU before it was the MCU. Yeah. There you go. And how about you, Trev? What do you got? You can see me on YouTube at uh, Trivial Theater. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at Trivia underscore Chick. And yes, if you want to watch any of her videos with her corny paw, uh, puns, you can uh, find some great videos like the Rocky Horror Picture Show collab or Scream Black Yellow Scream. So some good stuff on there. And uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, you can find me at uh, actually not Big Shadow anymore. Uh, Movie Emporium on Twitter as well as YouTube where I post all kinds of fabulous videos that will no longer be disliked, I guess, apparently. So yeah. Um, so. <laughs> not that you not that anybody will know. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> All for your mental health. Yes, 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 for our mental health. We'll know it, but nobody else will. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So, anyways, uh, with that said, we'll uh head out and we'll see you guys next time in the Twilight Zone. Peace out. Peace, love, chicken grease. <laughs> I'm out I'll to sock y'all in the puss. <laughs> with my dirty oh, stick. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I know what's going on at the end of this video. <laughs> shit damn it why do i always do that (laughs) my life i just left myself a remembrance too damn it